Okay, so the digital humanities roughly defined, in my mind, means two things. So one, it's using digital technologies to analyze literature, time periods, languages, and two, it's using all of those things that we traditionally do in the humanities to understand technology in new ways. And um, to me, it's best when it does both of those two things simultaneously. But also, it, it is uh, really crucial that digital humanities usually involves collaboration and interdisciplinary methods in some ways. So that's why you can imagine Matt and I working together on Digital East St. Louis, is thinking about how you use the humanities to reinvigorate interest in STEM fields and vice versa. It has a really broad definition and in the Iris Center we've pretty much spent the last 10 years trying to explain to people what it is and I think they still don't totally understand. But So one part of that is archival projects of all kinds of sorts and audiovisual work really fits into this. So it's um, these are just three examples. Um, this is the Walt Whitman Archive. It's one of the first digital humanities projects. And um, it is at the University of Nebraska. Collective, bi collective biographies of women is mostly text-based. So is the Whitman Archive, although it does have some images. And then this is the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And it's called In Motion, the African American Migration Experience. That has images, sound, no video. Um, but you can archive all kinds of things, oral histories, um, podcasts. So think of archiving as a place where you collect all kinds of audiovisual materials and then you explain their use and their importance. Have any of you ever done any kind of archival work with students? <laughs> yeah, Victoria. <laughs> Victoria got a lot of <laughs> hands-on insight into that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about Digital East St. Louis in a bit when we get to that part of the presentation. But um, one of the things that I think is really valuable to do with students when it comes to archival projects is to help them think about their roles as curators. So they're making decisions about the kinds of things they might save, what they think is not worth saving, how they describe the things that they save so that other people notice them or care about them. And so that's kind of a powerful experience for a student to be in. Um, not just seeing old things, but actually thinking about how to share old things with other people. So archival projects of all kinds can be useful in the classroom. Um, geography, space, and place, or sometimes called a spatial term, is also a really useful form of digital humanities research. Civil War Washington is one website that uses old maps of Washington, D.C. to kind of place narratives upon them. Um, and this was actually really important for what we did in Digital East St. Louis. So we did a lot of work where students built walking tours um, using maps of parks and neighborhoods in the city. Have any of you done anything like that? Bridget, I feel like you yeah, did. Yeah, we kind of started to, um, like, right before you guys took off with the yeah. project. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. I don't know. I mean, it was <laughs> very, like, bare bones, and it was intimidating to us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you say you did some mapping, was it paper mapping? And then when you tried yeah, to put it like in Yeah, we Google. had a huge East St. Louis map. We were numbering our, um, the, the spots that we had taken pictures at, that we were um, doing write-ups on, and then it was kind of like how we put that all together. And we had mapped it, had it on, I think it was in my room, on a big wall. And I was like, okay, we need to make this digital. Uh -huh. <laughs> Things that I'm going to talk about again and again, and I think 
you'll hear from all of us who are presenting again and again, is that digital itself isn't enough. And so you all already have the best skill that you can possibly have to do digital humanities work, which is that you know how to be really good humanities um, pedagogues. You know what to do to teach people how to, how to think. Um, and so one part of Digitally St. Louis was just to teach students about space and place. So we took trips, for example, um, we did a lot of trips in East St. Louis, but then Matt took students to the Del Mar Loop because they had never left the city, most of them, and they had no concept of how to do comparative work about the culture of a space because they'd never thought about those things. So it was impossible to do the walking tours without having had that other experience to think about how their, how their experiences in their space um, react uh, related to another space that was so much different. They noticed things like, oh, there are people here walking around with baby carriages and coffees. That's something people do, I have no idea. Yes. The uh, best field trip we took of the 70 we must have taken, <laughs> uh, it was actually probably 30 um, little ones and whatnot, was going to a grocery store. Yeah. Went to a grocery store in the Del Mar Oh, yeah. And it was, oh, it was a lot. You were there, weren't yeah. you? Yeah, that was a blast. The kids had so much fun. I mean, because it was an international grocery store and um, kids all got food and ate <laughs> there, which was interesting. <laughs> But it, it was just a, it was a really fun trip. Mm -hmm. um, but that being able to compare and seeing something that was different like that was, was really useful um, to draw back on. Not that all of you can just, you know, take all your kids on a bus for a day and go to a grocery store. Um, <laughs> or maybe you can, I don't know how free your school is. <laughs> but it, it was just an interesting thought. So that kind of work where you're taking the work you already do in the humanities and you're putting it in digital spaces and then you're thinking about the digital space in humanities-based ways is going to be really important. Those are the best things that you can remember about the kind of work that you're doing. Um, just a couple of tools though, in case you're interested. So Google Maps, Google My Maps specifically, is really easy to just start with this off the ground. And all of you could leave here without me saying anything else and I think you could, you could come up with all kinds of really easy, useful projects with that. Um, Digital East St. Louis looks similar to this because it uses a tool called Neatline, which is part of another tool called Omeka, sort of a sub-tool of Omeka. And um, that one has a little bit trickier startup, but Neatline is nice because it allows you to compare space and time. So there's a timeline that runs along the bottom, and when you add items, um, basically you can scroll along the bottom and points on the map will show up or go away, depending on where you are in time. So it allows for geospatial um, and temporal comparison. Do any of you have any others that you've used for maps besides those two? Anybody else ever done any mapping with students? Okay. I did, last summer I did a workshop with um, the Teaching with Primary Sources with the Library of Congress project. And I highly recommend, if you're interested in using maps at all, the Library of Congress has seven bajillion maps, yeah. um, and all kinds of them. The, the one that we got the most use out of was like an, an Aztec map that there was like a break in it where they followed the river down and there were, I don't know, cultural pieces to it and there was a large bird god on a <laughs> mountain and it was just, there's all kinds of crazy maps and so if you're interested in doing something like that with a historical perspective, highly recommend. Yeah, that's great, Matt. I was going to say David Rumsey, which is a free online tool, they have all kinds of historical maps too. The other reason Neatline should be good is that it allows you to um, geo-reference historical maps onto Google Maps essentially, so you kind of can match the points, but Ben and I can attest to the fact that that's a lot easier said than done in our yes, experience. I would not recommend it despite the fact that's supposed to be what makes Neatline good. So then some other things that you can do or that you might have done before, one is mining text. Voyant is my favorite kind of easy out of the box tool for that. Basically what you can do is you copy and paste, let's say you go to Project Gutenberg, you copy and paste all the raw text of say Dracula and it finds all the different references to words. So if you wanted to see how many times blood was used in Dracula and what words blood um, appears next to, to make all kinds of arguments that are um, 
based on data as opposed to, to typical analytical skills, it can be really useful. And it's also another interesting way to teach students that um, they might see things that happen quantitatively and realize that it means very little unless they apply qualitative analysis to it. So it's, I like it because it teaches students why qualitative analysis matters. Um, the finished screen is really, it creates all kinds of charts and graphs about, for example, if it was blood, you could see what part of the novel, was it the center of the novel, the end of the novel, where that word appears the most, in addition to what, it's called a collocate, a word that another word appears by is called a collocate. And then this is network analysis. This is obviously of Star Wars. You can see Chewbacca on there. We're gonna have a lot of Star Wars references, so I put that in there for Ben. Because no, thank you. His talk is all Star, so all Star Wars. <laughs> There's some other things, but mostly Star Wars. Um, so network analysis, you can do a couple of ways. You can, again, put a text in a machine, and then it tells you this character is connected to this character, connected to this character. That's almost completely useless in my experience. Um, <laughs> so usually the kind of more careful, I've done some analysis and I can see um, kind of like a crime scene in a way. This character is connected in a thread to this character, is connected in a thread to this character. Um, and students have the experience then of trying to visualize the relationships that they see evolving in a text. So that's kind of what's good about that. And there's lots of tools to do that, so if it's something you're interested in, Gephi is the one that I usually use with students. Um, it isn't that easy right off the bat, but if it's something you're interested in, I could help you get through kind of the harder parts of the setup. And what was that called? Gephi, G-E-P-H-I. So there's lots of different versions of the digital humanities. Those are just some of them. So we've already talked a little bit about Digitally St. Louis. Um, that was a three-year project involving middle school participants. And we met on Saturdays during the school year, 16 Saturdays, and then in the summer, every summer for five weeks, all day long. <laughs> <laughs> and we did a lot of different things with them. So basically, this was the website that was kind of an archive that a lot of the work they did went into it. Um, so they did podcasts, and they did documentaries, many documentaries, and they did um, oral histories, and they did picture exhibits, and they did walking tours. Every year was sort of one other piece that added to the whole. And at the end, they made a kind of big exhibit on a theme, so a theme related to the city. There was food, music, sports. It was sort of we allowed them to take their own interests and build on those interests when they were in the process of putting together the archive. So we've learned a lot about um, what works with students, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, and Matt can also pop in here and there. <laughs> I can also hopefully point out some things that are going to go wrong yeah. so that you don't have to um, go through those same steps that I did many, <laughs> many times. It was an informal learning environment, which is a lot different than day-to-day -day curriculum. So one of the ways we got them there, we, we, we didn't have a guaranteed audience. They had their friends, and so that's why they wanted to come a lot of times. So we had to build on the fact that they liked spending time with one another, and then make the activities that we developed something that they would continue to want to do to come, even in the middle of the cold winter, and in the middle of the summer when they'd rather be playing basketball, a lot of them. On the bright side, your students are legally required one time, though, the bus driver just randomly picked up other kids who hadn't signed up for the program at all. So also, that won't happen to you. That was, that was the it, worst day. It is true. Our bus driver did kidnap a whole bunch of kids. <laughs> from the Hopia. Um, were you there that day, too? That was yep. Yeah, that was the worst. <laughs> Um, and then, just starting now, a lot of people in this room are a part of the Conversation Toward a Brighter Future 2.0 program, which is a project that is about digital storytelling. And so we're going to talk a lot about digital storytelling over the next two days and, and what that looks like. And that project is really interrogating age and intergenerational relationships. And in some ways, it's a way to talk about rat, race, class, all kinds of other social issues that divide us, but through something that maybe at first doesn't seem as divisive. So these are some things I'm going to talk about in greater depth in a second. 
Um, but there are kind of five things that I have found are really essential to digital humanities pedagogy. And it relates to, I think, what you were talking about, Bridget, the, the extra workload of it, the fact that students can become a little bit truculent sometimes when things don't work well. So these are some fail safes and ways that I've found to deal with those things. Um, and the first is that students are not really used to this idea <coughs> that they would just play with things. Um, they're expecting grades. They're expecting a finished product. They're expecting to turn something into you and get immediate feedback and that there's a very clear set of rules that they should follow and that that will result in the grade that they want. So before you do anything else, you kind of have to reframe their relationship to what they're doing. So that means from the beginning, telling them and also creating an environment in which you're encouraging the idea of tinkering, building, experimentation, um, and grading is important with that because that's where students kind of get really uncomfortable. They'll say, if I don't know how to do this, I'm not gonna get a good grade. And so you have to figure out how, <laughs> through your assessment, to say to students, um, I'm gonna reward you for taking risks and we're gonna focus on process rather than product. Um, and then, this is something I'm sure you all do. You're all familiar with the challenges of group work with students. You're gonna have all of those challenges here. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. So think about ways that you can talk about group work, not just as plain old group work, but as um, collaboration and think about collaboration as something that's maybe different than group work. And that can take many forms. So when they're in an English class in particular doing group work, they're imagining sitting down with a group and talking through things and then turning in something at the end that they report to you. Whereas the collaboration involved in the digital humanities sometimes means taking a big project, figuring out what part of that project each of them plays, and sometimes working on their own, but then figuring out how to bring back their own piece to fit into that larger piece so that it is still, um, still makes a larger whole. And that's difficult for them to learn how to do. Um, it's also important for them because they realize that the work that they're doing is reliant on the work that everybody else does in a way that's maybe not always as clear in regular group work. And then the last thing is, um, Developing a curriculum that uses technology to reevaluate content or examines technology itself as content. And that goes back to that very first thing I was saying where um, you don't want the digital tool there just for the sake of the digital tool, just to say you're using it. You want to um, use it to speak to the humanities and then you want the humanities to speak back to it. So there's lots of ways that you can do that and we'll talk about them over time. Do any of you have anything that you use already to do some of this kind of work with students? good examples or failures since we're talking about why failure is a good thing. You have things you tried that didn't work well? I have some things. <laughs> <laughs> I tried cookie spaces with my students. I tried uh, uh, with one of even my better students. I failed spectacularly at blogging. Um, blogging is hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Getting people to blog is hard. Yes, it is. Um, Speaking of subjects, I do with undergrads. I, I did want to actually say my favorite part of working with you was coming from the STEM side. I was very much, like you said, it, we don't want it to be the technology itself as content, and that's basically where I live, is the, <laughs> like the technology itself might be the content, and so just kind of working in the digital humanities opened up my mind a little bit more to technology being a tool to enhance what you're doing. Um, and it was it was fun working with the students to like you could you know write a paper about what they were you know the history of their city that they were learning about but then talking to them about if we have a website how does that change what we're doing or if we make a podcast where we went to the uh, senior center there and did oral history interviews with just seniors that happened to be there that day and which was exciting um, <laughs> day after we presented our oral histories, it was rated by the FBI. So that was exciting <laughs> as well. Um, it, it was also the East St. Louis Township. And apparently it was like $100,000 or something. Um, but it, it was interesting to talk to them about what with this technology can we do that's different than just writing about what we want? Mm -hmm. And how does that enhance 
um, how does that enhance what you learn and how you share it? So it's a lot of fun. We talked a lot with them about interface design, for example. So um, we were teaching them how to code along with everything else we were doing. And they got really excited about the process of coding. And so at first, the website was absolutely horrific. We toned it down a little bit, but it had emojis everywhere. It had every color you could possibly imagine. And so it also allows students, I think, to, to imagine an audience in ways that a paper doesn't allow. So we could say, OK, no, no one can read this. <laughs> what can you do to make this a pleasing experience for somebody else that goes there? And, and what does is, what is the visual contribute to the overall message that you're trying to convey with the exhibit you're building? I think that 95% plus of their audience, or 95% of the time plus, is you. you. You're their audience for what they're writing or doing, and the 5% is also a really special project that um, teachers do. But most of the time, they're just writing to a single person that is you, that is judging them, potentially harshly. <laughs> <laughs> and there's something kind of special about having that audience be like, somebody in Cambodia that's interested, they saw something about you know, their city, they Googled something and there it pops up and now they're reading. I don't know why I chose Cambodia, but I didn't. Um, and with so Conversation Toward a Brighter Future, you're going to have a bit of a built-in audience because you'll have the summits, so the audience will be other students, it will be adults, it will be, I think, broad and varied, which is going to be a really good thing to be able to talk to them about. Okay, so tinkering is a concept that I'm sure you've heard that word before, um, but you might not be as familiar with it in a, in a pedagogical context. It actually comes from, I think, 15th century Scotland, and it meant people who would take old, broken things and try to make something new out of them, um, sometimes with very success, and then sell them. <laughs> so that's its etymology. Um, but as it says, it's typically in a clumsy, bungling, or imperfect way, and that's kind of the spirit that we want to encourage in students. So a kind of a more modern definition, it's someone who experiments with materials and ideas to fully understand their capacities, and who further iterates on their learning to find better solutions to current problems. And then this is Gentry Sayers, who kind of is the person who started to use this word for the digital humanities. He says, embracing tinkering's inexpert, tactical, and situational experimentation lends itself well to introducing students of literature and language to otherwise unfamiliar modes of learning. So it basically means looking under the hood, which I know we do in all kinds of ways, but it's also just saying, you don't have to have a finished outcome out of this. Just play with things and see what happens. And that voyant with the, where you just put in all of Dracula and then it spits out some responses, and then you get to kind of, um, spitball possible reasons why those responses are there, and then discover it was just because you didn't take all the articles out of your base text. Those are the kinds of things that they would learn over time, and that's kind of a typical example of tinkering. Um, I also like to do it in class, not digitally. So, um, and college students have varying levels of comfort with that, like bringing in, your students will have more comfort with this, bringing in markers, bringing in clay, bringing in various things for them to play with as a way for them to get comfortable in that space if they're not comfortable in digital spaces so that um, they have a sense of it before they even get on the computer. Okay, so tinkering, as you can see, encourages inquisitiveness. You could also bring in you know, sticks and <laughs> gumballs. <laughs> um, by addressing how things work and how they are constructed in a social context. So looking under the hood is an example of that. Um, technological literacy, I think, is a really interesting term for why tinkering matters, because um, students use technology all the time, and they consider themselves to be proficient. But what do your students typically consider themselves to be proficient in? What are the things in technology that you think good at? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that space has been constructed for them. So one of the things that I think is important for um, why the digital humanities matters is that it makes students producers of technological tools as opposed to just passive users. And it, there are, so we had the social network example. Another thing you can do with social networking 
is you could take a student's Facebook profile and put it into a visualizing machine like the one we were using there, and you could see the network of who they talk to and the kinds of things that they talk about. So you could kind of take the social media aspect and turn it on its head and say, okay, let's analyze you <laughs> and your decisions instead of a text decisions if you wanted to. Um, have any of you ever, I know a lot of professors and um, also high school teachers do that assignment where they have, they create um, social media accounts for characters. Have any of you tried that before? Did it work? What were the things you liked or didn't like about it? It was a lot of fun. Um, when I was teaching American literature, we read the Crucible and students created Twitter accounts for some of the top characters and they had to create hashtags and, you know, all kinds of things that, you know, were involved with we ended up hanging up the hashtags and the profiles and a lot of the um, tweets around the classroom and the students walked around and they were, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I think kids really enjoyed it. Now it's something that I know a lot of the American literature teachers in my department are starting to do with their kids because it's a more interactive and fun way of thinking about the crucible. Mm -hmm. that's, so that's applied to you know things that are relevant to them in their own culture. I think it also media. demonstrates that social media is generative and they don't necessarily see it as that. So right. it's creating their identity, but they don't right. know that they're doing that as a Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, they had hashtags like hard out there for a witch, like, you know, <laughs> like stuff like that. I mean, it was just, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. I've and done then, like that sort of the Odyssey. They've done oh, Facebook okay. and then there's like hashtags, daddy props. It's <laughs> 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 never seen as bad. But then this year I did memes for oh. Beowulf, oh, nice. and they had to do memes for three different characters in Beowulf, and I got, I, I probably have to say it somewhere, but I got a lot of good ones. Some of them were on the borderline of inappropriate, but I took seniors, I'm like, eh, I'll let it slide. Because yeah. <laughs> no one's going to see this but me, so like, it was, they really got into it, and they were a lot better at, at it than I could ever be. So. Well, and I think that's one of the skills that they have because they're younger and they've been working in audiovisual spaces more is that they they have the technological literacy to think about the relationship between text and image more than we were ever trained to do. And they all um, had to create three memes and like a lot of them went on to do more because they were having so much fun with it. So <laughs> nice. Yeah, so I think those are the kinds of things that you want to encourage, just places where you use the tools that they're used to using, but then help them reframe how they think about those tools by using the humanities and works of literature. That's great. I'm curious, this relates to the transition between this slide and that slide. How many of you have experimented with forms of assessment um, that do allow students to to um, take some risks and deal with failure? And if so, what have you done? Yeah, but it's also really important 
in order to get it right so that people can find it later for searchability purposes. So part of it is explaining um, what the reason is for the parts of it that aren't glamorous or fun necessarily. But I think it's also um, giving them the space to talk about why things work or do not work. So I think it's really interesting that you did Native American folk tales because um, there's an article that I read recently that was about Haudenosaunee representations of time and how all the digital tools that we have to describe time are, are very Western in conception and they don't necessarily work to describe Native American experience or perceptions of time. And um, so those are the kinds of ways in which you can take something that's not working and say, okay, why isn't it working? Is there a cultural reason that it's not working? Because often I think students don't realize too that we're the ones that make technology. They think it's just, it yeah. just appears. Um, and, and that our own cultural misconceptions are the things that shape it and then sometimes make it limiting to describe the story we want to describe. We tried to do a talk show last year. Um, after we read Taming of the Shrew, I tried to do like uh, marriage counseling and um, <laughs> there was a lot of issues. <laughs> and, uh, part of it was what you touched on earlier about assessing it. And I wanted them to, I made it bigger than what have 30 kids, it was an honors class, so all they wanted, you know, they want to know how they're being assessed, they want to know what the grade is. I'm like, I don't know yet, I just made this up. Um, and then I put them into groups, uh, and then I, they all got roles and everything, and then they, re they were recording it, and it turned into like a long process. We had to record during class time, and we had this much time, and so a lot of them complained that they weren't, they didn't feel like they had enough time, and then, um, I think, I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. because that is one of the hardest things, is that it does take more time. And it feels like maybe you're wasting time. Yeah. And you have to just let that happen, even though right. it's driving you insane. And then like, oh, this person isn't here today, so what are we, we can't do anything today, but then the other group was like rolling right along, chugging along, and then and I had them create, like, because I had so many kids, and there's only so many Tammy the Shrew characters that were, were relevant, so I was like, okay, well you guys are going to make a commercial, and so some of them were kind of a commercial, and I mean, they, they really did really well. Um, but, and then again, at the end, it was like, well, how many points is this worth? And it was just like, can we just do this, like, for fun? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it makes them better, like, in a rubric, I'll actually say, process and ask for evidence that they worked on something so that it's not, it's not just the final product, it's, um, <coughs> Anything that they can show me that says, okay, I've grown, these are the ways I've grown, these are all the ways I've tried to solve the problem, and that has as much of a point value as whatever the finished thing is, so that they can demonstrate that they've worked through whatever problem they're having. Um, I've had some good luck because I am the sponsor of the book club, uh -huh. and we, do, we don't read a book and talk about it, we just do like book things, activities, and a lot of these things that you guys do, we do it in book club first try it out uh -huh. because it's not for a grade, it's just for fun, just for fun. And, we, and then it like makes its way into the curriculum later <laughs> after we've tested it out. Do they act the same toward whatever it is? Yeah, they, they, we try to make it fun, mm -hmm. so like we did the Facebook thing and like that was a huge hit. We're like, okay, I think we can safely move this into the classroom, like we kind of test out some what could go wrong. So we've done a lot of that. Um, it's nice to have a testing space. Yes, and the co- <laughs> book club sponsor is an ELA teacher, so mm -hmm. then she's like, I, I really like to try this in the classroom, I'm just not brave enough, so we'll try the book club first and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. But, great. and then you've got the you've got the kids there who are already like super interested in reading, so, I mean, that skews it a little bit, but um, we've had some good luck with that, so. Anybody else, Jack? My, um, sorry. That's first a Tuesday, Tuesday sorry. First Tuesday. Don't though. worry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my the cat club project is <laughs> sorry. Happens, yeah. <laughs> sorry. My seniors have to do a research project that's a capstone paper, but um, I want them to present those in, in a talk like a TED stuff talk of the day. And I, I want them they don't have to when they get there, but I want them to use Prezi for mm -hmm. that for for a variety of reasons. But so I start the semester with them using it in kind of low risk situations. Not, not unlike the way we introduced that partner, they have to inter 
interview someone, learn information about them, and build a privacy around them. And they, they have to use privacy, and it, it, they can't break it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't right. work. They're great doesn't depend on how well they use Prezi, but they have several opportunities to play with it before they give their research presentations at the end. So um, they have, there are failures in learning the technology. There are stylistic failures there. They tend to put a lot of text in their presentations and read to us. And so they have lots of opportunities to learn how to not do that and use the technology to help them make their argument rather than um, just be a, you know, projected text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like that model, the idea that they get all of these different experiences before the final one that counts. Yeah, no, yeah. And then at the end, if the you know, the kids that are most resistant to try something new, if they have to be powerful, of course they don't tell them they can't, but at least they've had, you know, six or seven tries at, at something else before they get that one. Do you want to say something, Bridget? I had a similar yeah. experience with, uh, I had my students use Powkin make storyboards. Oh, I haven't used some that. Some of them got so, and they're basically storyboards, but you can animate the storyboards with little cartoon characters and stuff. And they had a lot of fun, the ones that were savvy. The ones that didn't got really frustrated quick. So I just let them do actual tactile, handwritten, with cut out newspapers and stuff like that, magazines. <laughs> and so it allowed the ones that didn't want to mess with the computer and didn't have the savvy to still do it, complete the project, and then watch the rest of their classmates. Yeah. And so it really, by the end of it, the ones that hadn't used PowerTune were actually kind of upset with themselves. And so had had more time, I think they really would have jumped in because they saw how fun it was for the other students. But they still got to create and finish the project and get the points. So. Well, and that relates to something you're probably going to hear me say over and over again in 15 different ways. Um, but it's because what I started studying was book history, which is um, like basically how a physical book impacts how we read the physical book. That's how I often think about technology. And so when I hear you talk about that assignment, I think it also leaves open this place for students to think about, okay, what happened between the, the physical tactile version and the digital version? What were the um, possibilities and limitations of each, and how did they influence how we think about what we finally had in front of us? Um, and so that's kind of why I like the digital humanities, too, because it allows us to think about the kind of hidden um, cultural underpinnings of format, and we often think that doesn't matter, especially with books. We think, oh, the book just comes to me and it's the pure spirit of the author instead of all these other people who influenced our relationship to that text. And the same is obviously true of technology. Emily, did you have a question? I thought. Oh. No. <laughs> um, so these are some other kind of tips of things you can do. Um, describe the class itself as an experiment is maybe one of the most important takeaways. And as a teacher, that can be a kind of dangerous and painful thing to open yourself up to. But it is usually a way to make students feel a little bit safer if you say, I'm experimenting with this new thing. And so you're experimenting too. And if things aren't working well, we will all refigure. If we don't have enough time, I can give you more time. If we don't have enough X, then of course, then you have to be open to when students come to you and say, I need more time, or this isn't going well. Um, so it, it creates some vulnerability <laughs> about your own teaching, but it's usually worthwhile. I think we've talked about a lot of the other ones. Um, peer evaluation is something those of you who are English teachers in the room have a lot of experience with, but it's really important to do that when you're doing digital humanities-based work, too, because they're not used to thinking about that format. They're not used to thinking about um, user interface, visuals, how all of those things impact their finished product. And so it gives them an audience to kind of work with. And sharing failure narratives like we were doing earlier is, is really useful too. You can say, okay, um, tell me specifically what went well, what didn't go well, and what are you going to do next time differently? What did you learn from the failure? so that students don't think of failure as an end in and of itself. Um, this is more about that collaborative part of digital humanities, that they're working on a really big project together. And they're each doing their own part. You need to um, build in a little bit of an infrastructure so that they have some autonomy to do that work, so that the minute they get in the room, they can just start cracking it. 
So um, if you establish a workflow from the beginning, these are all the things that have to happen uh, with check boxes for when those things are completed. Um, one of the things that we do with students here, because we have a lot of students who are working on projects in the center outside of classes, um, is that we have all the tutorials in, in Google Docs, and one of the things that we do is if students are working on something and they go to the tutorial and it doesn't work or they don't think the description is good enough, then they get to change it. So it just gets better with time and it gives them a sense that they own the project as well. Um, and because there's that workflow, it can sometimes feel as though you've made all the decisions for them, so you just have to be very careful with that. Make them do the work of building the workflow with you from the very beginning. What are the things that need to happen? Let's write them down together. Let's think about what steps are logical and then check in from time to time and say, is this workflow working? And then this is really important with <laughs> when you're working with students on big projects like that, just make sure you're, you're always there backing things up. So in the Iris Center, we talk about it like it's a teaching hospital. Luckily, we don't have actual patients that they kill, but they do kill big data sets a lot. <laughs> So just make sure that you have as many fail-safes for yourself as you can, especially if it's something you're using with multiple students across multiple semesters. And that is all I have for you.